Any, any questions about anything before we start? Okay. Well, today what I want to do is I want to wrap up the... First, I want to turn off the projector. This, I have to retrain myself every semester that people fail to turn off the projector and thereby burn out the light bulbs, which cost lots of money. But anyway, today what I want to do is first, the first part of the class, I want to wrap up this discussion of this heavy duty sort of abstract foundational stuff and then move on to our first kind of like nitty gritty topic, which is kind of working with integers, prime factorization, cryptography, primes, and all that kind of stuff. So remember where we were at last time, we, we've been talking about these various sets of numbers that we're going to be dealing with over the course of the semester. And the picture we have so far is we have the natural numbers and the integers and the rational numbers. And remember what you get when you move up a step in this hierarchy from the natural numbers you get additive inverses for the integers, from the integers to the rationals you get multiplicative inverses and more so you have a notion of additional multiplication still. We also talked about cardinality and cardinality of a finite set is just the number of things in the set. Cardinality of an infinite set is a little more complicated and so we only talk about it in a relative sense when the cardinality of a set A is less than or equal to the cardinality of a set B or equal and so on. And we said a set is countably infinite if and only if its cardinality is the same as the cardinality of the natural numbers. If and only if you can establish a bijective mapping between the set A and the natural numbers. And we showed that the integers, at least, are countably infinite. So that's one thing we've taken care of. And at the end of class last time, we had a little poll. We had the Manish versus Alex poll. Is Manish here someplace? Oh, there you are. Um, about whether the rational numbers were countably infinite or not. And it turns out the answer is yes. And I asserted that last time without proving it. And so today what I want to do is I want to start out and give you a real quick argument to show why the rational numbers are actually countable. So here's a fact. And this is new, so I better not put it in the list of recall stuff. The rational numbers are also countably infinite. And the way we're going to do this is, first, I'm going to use that theorem I mentioned last time, the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem. Okay, what did that say? That said if the cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of B, and the cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, then the cardinalities are equal. So the first step here is, clearly, I'll put that in quotes because that's, some teachers use that as a bludgeon against the class, you know, clearly, you know, it was just sort of like, if you dare ask me a question about this, then you're lost. But I don't mean it that way. So I put it in quotes. Anything in quotes is kind of one step removed from hardcore assertion. So clearly, cardinality of n, the natural numbers, is less than or equal to cardinality of q. Now, how does one establish a cardinality inequality like that? What is the definition of cardinality of one set being less than or equal to that of another? It means you have to find an injective mapping from the lower set to the bigger set. So someone proposed to me an injective mapping from the natural numbers into the rational numbers. Yes? Yeah, let's use F for, for, for this instead. And what's your name, by the way? William. William. Okay, you're, you're one of the maybe 15 or so people in the room I don't know yet, name-wise. Okay, because... The mapping f from n to q that just takes the natural number n, so defined by f of n equals n, is injective. And very often we're going to have this as our, our sort of prototypical way of showing that one set has lower cardinality than the other. Okay, now how do we show the opposite inequality? And to do it in a couple steps. So 
So to see why cardinality of Q is less than or equal to cardinality of N, proceed as follows. And this is only one of many ways to do it. First off, what I want to do is I want to show that the cardinality of Q, so number one, show that cardinality of Q is less than or equal to the cardinality of Z cross Z. And remember, Z cross Z is the Cartesian, the Armenian mathematician named after a thing, product of Z with itself. It's a set of all ordered pairs of integers, M comma N. And the way we do this is by defining an injective mapping from rationals into that set. And this one is a little less easy than that one, but does anyone have a proposal for that? Okay, let me give you a hint. Every rational number you can write as a ratio P over Q, where Q is non-zero, both of those are integers. And if you want, you can absorb the sign of the rational number SIGN into the numerator. And you can always do that so P and Q have no common factors. It's in lowest terms. So what would be a good way? Yeah. Yes, exactly. What he said. Given a rational number P over Q and in this rational number I'm going to let P less than zero if necessary. So if P over Q is less than zero, let's, let's absorb the sign into the numerator. Map P and Q to find, let's say, G from Q into Z cross Z by means of the prescription G of P over Q is equal to the pair P comma Q. Now that mapping turns out to be injective. It's pretty easy to see that there's only one way to write a rational number in lowest terms where the sign, if it's negative, is absorbed into the numerator. But it's not surjective. Why not? Give me an example of a pair PQ that is not in the range of that mapping. Yeah. Yeah, that's, an, that's one. How about giving me an example where both of the P and Q are non-zero? Alex? Yeah, if P, if P comma P is never there, because that wouldn't be in lowest terms. Or more generally, if I had, you know, 38 comma 19, that wouldn't be there. Anyway, okay, this is injective. So that mapping is injective, which means that card Q is less than or equal to card Z cross Z. Second step is show that card Z cross Z is the same as the card of N cross N. And that's easy to do using the Alex Rucker mapping from last time, right? Remember we, we had a way of mapping the integers and the natural numbers one to one onto each other bijectively. And if you just double up that mapping, you get a bijective mapping between these two sets. So all you do is you just double up the bijection we saw before, the bijection from last time that paired n with the integers. So from this we conclude 1 and 2 so far imply that card Q is less than or equal to the card of n cross n because it's less than or equal to card Z cross Z, which is equal to the card of N cross N. And the final step is going to be to show that the card of N cross N is the same as the card of N. And this is the one that requires a little bit of trickery. <laughs> 
So finally, card of n cross n equals card of n. And the way to see this is as follows. n cross n, remember what that is. That's the set of all ordered pairs of natural numbers. So you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 19, 10 to the 59th, all that kind of stuff. You can think of n cross n as a grid of dots. So it's going to look like this. And it's going to go on. Unfortunately, we can't, if I use dots for this, I can't use dot, dot, dot to show that it goes on. But it goes on infinitely in this direction and in this direction. And this point here is 0, 0. This is 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0. This is 3, 3. This is 1, 3. Get it? Does everyone understand what I'm, I'm doing there? Thinking of n cross n as a grid of dots, a rectangular grid that's infinite in two of its four directions. OK. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to map the natural numbers onto that grid. And it's going to be a bijective mapping between the natural numbers and the points on that grid by labeling them with natural numbers. So I'm going to label this one 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. See what's going on there? And so on. So what we're doing is we're threading the natural numbers through that grid. And by doing so, we obtain a bijective mapping. So by threading n through the grid, we get a bijective mapping, or a bijection. That's another name for bijective mapping between n and n cross n. Clearly, it's injective. No natural number goes to the same dot. And clearly, it's surjective because every dot eventually gets hit. OK, so now the conjunction of 1 and 2 and 3 shows that card Q being less than or equal to card of n cross n is less than or equal to card of n. And that completes our argument for card Q less than or equal to card of n. And the conclusion is card Q is card n. And thus, the rationals are countable. All righty. And this is all by the this this whole thing pretty much in one order or another is in the monograph if you if you lose track of it in the room today. Okay, so now let's wrap it up. We've got we've got the natural numbers, the integers, the rationals. What else do we need to do signals and systems math? Uh, we actually need a fair amount more. Yeah, well, yeah, we need the irrationals, which are part of the reals, you know. And the real not so. What are the real numbers? What? How do we get those from the the rational numbers? What's missing from the rational numbers? Let's think about that for a sec. They have, you know, what could possibly go wrong? We have multiplicative inverses for everybody. We have, we have an addition operation that distributes over or um, that is distributed over by a multiplication operation, both of which are commutative. We have identity elements. We have everything. We have. Everything but, well, let's see what that but is. So here's a question. What's missing from Q that we might need? Well, one thing we haven't observed so far is that all of these sets of numbers, the natural numbers, the integers, and the rationals, have an ordering, and they have a notion of distance between them. So note that, in particular Q, so on the rational numbers Q, we have a notion of distance. And we do also, on 
the natural numbers and on the integers, but in those cases, it's pretty trivial. It's just in the integer difference absolute value between two integers or two natural numbers. But on the rationals, it's non-trivial because if you think about how the rational numbers are laid out in the world, they can be really close together, really close together. So in particular, you have pairs of rational numbers getting so I know exactly where those those noises are going to happen. So it's less of a shock, you know, lowering the boards. In, a, in particular, we have pairs of rational numbers that are arbitrarily close together. Okay, so that's something cool about the rationals. There, there's, even though there's only countably many of them, there's zillions of them. So many that they get arbitrarily close together. Now I want to look at a sequence of rational numbers. So consider the following sequence. And I'm actually going to give you two sequences, maybe even three. And we'll have a lot more to say about sequences later on when we talk about working with real numbers and limits and bounds and all that kind of stuff. But for now, let's just look at this example. 3, 3 3.1, 3.14, 3.141, 3.1. These are all rational numbers, right? Because they're terminating decimals. Etc. Okay, everybody knows where we're going with that, right? Like last year, remember, was Pi Day was the, the only day in the 21st century where you have 3, 14, 15, and then like you had to go at a certain time of day, you know, that kind of thing, right? Anyway, so what does that go to? What, they, what does that go to? Come on, guys, just say it. Pi. pi. But wait, pi is not a rational number. You're going to have to take my word on that. You can actually prove that. Pi is not a rational number. But this sequence of rational numbers is getting closer and closer together as you go out in it. Consecutive ones are at most 0. .0000 whatever 9 apart for whatever it is, however far out you are. But they don't have anywhere to go in the set Q, okay? This sequence, this sequence converges into itself. It sort of, it sort of clumps up. Gets, quote unquote, closer and closer together. But has nowhere to go in Q. Because where it goes, we all know from our previous knowledge, is somewhere outside of Q, the irrational number pi. So it has nowhere to go in Q. OK, so that's one example. Here's another example. One. 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 half, 1 plus 1 plus, or I think I have an extra 1 here. So let's, let's start this over again. One, 1 plus 1 half, 1 plus 1 half plus 1 sixth, 1 plus 1 half plus 1 sixth plus 1 over, give you a big hint here, 4 factorial and so on. Do I, do I need that extra one? Maybe I do. Let's think. Yes, I do. OK, I was right the first time. So let's put it back. 
Okay, what does that go to? Say it louder. E. And you'll have to take my word for it. E, like pi, is not a rational number. In fact, by the way, both E and pi are not just irrational. Does anyone know the word for what they are? It's, it's, a, it's, yet, an, it's, it's a yet another, uh, further more exotic number than just an irrational number. Transcendental, yeah. Okay. So again, this has nowhere to go to Q. The successive terms get closer and closer together. They gather closer together, but have nowhere to go. At least in Q, italics mine. Okay, so what do we do? What, what do we need? What do we need more? We need places for sequences like this to go. And that's how we get the reals from the rationals. There's a name for sequences like this, and we'll be, get more technical about it in a couple weeks. But today I'm just being very casual about it. So sequences such as these, sequences that get closer and closer together, So sequences that, quote unquote, get closer together in this fashion. And I promise you more details later, in a couple weeks when we talk about these, are called Cauchy sequences. And there's a nice technical way of defining a Cauchy sequence using epsilons and m's and n's and deltas and all that kind of thing. We'll get to that later on. But if we take Q and throw in limits, for all such sequences, we have in some sense completed Q in an important way. And the word complete as actually has a technical meaning here. We, there's a notion of a complete metric space, is one where every Cauchy sequence has a limit. And that's what we form if we throw in limits for all the Cauchy sequences. And what we get, the real numbers. And the notation for those, as you might imagine, is going to be R in that same kind of blackboard bold font. Okay, so that's what was missing from the rationals. And by the way, you know, this is all revisionist history. This is not how it all happened. Like if you read that book that, that he referred to a couple of classes ago, actually he didn't refer to it in class. I'll, I'll bring it up, I'll tell you the title. It's called Mathematics, the Loss of Certainty by Morris Klein. He talks at length about how for many centuries people were using irrational numbers without even really quite believing they existed. And there was no sort of organizing framework for all these number systems. This is all sort of done ex post facto. It's been done since the late 1800s, taking a look back and saying, hey, if we think about this correctly, we can build, we can build the natural numbers out of nothing, then we can build the integers out of the naturals, the rationals out of the integers, the reals out of the rationals, and that's what people do. And so now what have we got? We've got n subset of z, subset of q, subset of R. And again, every one of these containments, you add something you kind of need. And the Q to R jump, you add limits for all the Cauchy sequences. Okay. What about cardinality of the reals?
Clearly, it's at least countably infinite. But is it countably infinite? How many people think the reals are countable? How many? Yeah, no. Yeah, you do. Okay, that's all right. You're wrong, but it's all right. <laughs> How many people think they're uncountably infinite? Okay, good. More people are voting. Fewer abstentions as we go along. That's better. That's good. That's good. You know, we, uh, I keep reading these articles about your generation being apathetic at the polls. Okay. You don't even want to go vote because they're all the same or they're all wacko or whatever, you know. But most of you voted in that poll and you were right. Fact. The real numbers are not countably infinite. And there's a neat proof of that that uses something called Cantor's diagonal argument, which you learned about in whatever course or secondary school. Where, where, when did you learn about it? In high school. I didn't learn about it until I was a senior in college when I took those logic classes, actually. And this is something that, if you, if you take, by the way, th this material here and, and also the, the stuff on cryptography and prime factorization and all that, a lot of it is covered in CS2800. So you, those of you who've taken that class are going get, to be getting a little bit of a review. But anyway, Cantor's diagonal argument proves that, and that's in the monograph. You could read about it there. I'm not going to do that in class. It's a really clever way to show that the reals are not countably infinite. And the question is, how infinite are they if they're not countable? So question. How infinite, quote unquote, is R? In other words, where does cardinality of the reals lie in the what's called the hierarchy, and this is something you can read about in that Rucker book, of infinite cardinals. And I'm not even going to bother telling you what the hierarchy of infinite cardinals is, but suffice it to say, the lowest such thing is the cardinality of the natural numbers, which people call Aleph naught. And the next higher one is what we call Aleph 1 and Aleph 2. And you can, you can define those in terms of the successive ones. OK, where does the cardinality, is it the next highest cardinality above the natural numbers, Manish? Um, I think so. Aleph 1 is 2 raised to the Aleph null. No, the cardinality of R is 2 raised to the Aleph null. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But Aleph 1 is not defined that way. OK? Yep. Yes. Well, in the same way that we threw in additive inverses for all the, all the natural numbers to get the integers, and threw in multiplicative inverses for all the non-zero integers to get the rationals, that's what I mean by throw in limits. Just sort of make up things and say, this is an additive inverse for one. I'm going to add that to set. This is an additive inverse for, you know, add that to set. And, so, and really, the process is a little more complicated, because you can have two different Cauchy sequences that approach the same limit. And you, so you have to do something called take equivalence classes of Cauchy sequence limits. But I, you know, I don't want to go there. That's, if you want to learn about that, take Math 4130. Seriously. It's, it's, <laughs> have you ever taken it? No. no? You're not, you don't want to take it. I didn't want to take any math And you're here. <laughs> oh, so who forced you to come? Uh, the ECE requirements? It was either this or probability? You heard bad things about probability? No. Anyway, okay, the, the, the answer to this is nobody knows. Nobody knows how infinite the reals are. They might be the most infinite thing around. Or they might be the next highest level of infinity over Aleph naught. So here's the answer. Nobody knows. But this is, let me, let me just take what you, Manish, said a minute ago, and, and I'll tell you what we do know about the cardinality of the reals. And this, again, is in the monograph. Well, 
what we do know, and this is easy to prove, is that the cardinality of the reals is equal to the cardinality of what's called the power set of the natural numbers. And let me tell you what that is. The power set of the rational numbers is the set of all subsets of the natural numbers. And in fact, the power set of any set is the set of all subsets of that set. And if you have a finite set, the power set, the set of all subsets, has, and it has two to the cardinality of that set elements in it. And so, by extension, we, we, ta we call this cardinality of that thing two to the aleph naught. Okay? And the way you do this, the way you show this, is by putting this set in one-to-one -one correspondence with binary decimals or bessimals, whatever you want to call them. You know, like dot point zero one 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 zero one 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 and so on. Every real number has an expansion in terms in that way, and some real numbers have two such expansions. The the ones that are like rational numbers that have two to the k in the denominator. And all the binary sequences are easily put shown to correspond one to one with the power set of the natural numbers. And so we have that relationship. But we don't know whether cardinality of the reals is the next highest cardinal. And there's a name for the assertion. So that here's something that's called the continuum hypothesis. And that says that the cardinality of the reals is equal to the next highest cardinality to the cardinality of the natural numbers. And nobody knows whether the continuum hypothesis is true or not. It may very well be, and it may not be. And the reason they call it the continuum hypothesis is because another uh, rather prosaic, poetic, whatever, way of referring to the cardinality of the reals is the power of the continuum. Have you ever heard that? No? Okay. Anyway. Okay, so that's the reals. We're not quite done yet. What's missing from the reals? What's that? No, the ra irrationals are in there. Every irrational number is the limit of a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers. You can prove that. Imaginary numbers. Yeah. Why do we need them? Who? Why would anyone... I mean... What, Balazs? What? <laughs> okay, why don't you come up and... No. <laughs> You need a bigger piece of. Ch no. Does that stay in the video? <laughs> <laughs> no, they couldn't hear him. They could only hear me, and but they know who it was because I said his name. All right. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, the imaginary numbers are what's missing. But why do we need them? You know, why, why do we need the imaginary numbers? Anyone have an idea? Just. Yep. Roots of polynomials. Yeah. Exactly. Like, like, you can write down a really simple polynomial with real coefficients. That doesn't have any roots in the reals. So, that's the question, and he gave us the right answer. The answer is roots for polynomials like, say, t squared plus 1 equals 0. Okay, that doesn't have any real roots. K 
can't plug any real numbers in there and get zero. Well, actually, roots of polynomials like t squared plus one, those are solutions to the equation t squared plus one equals zero. So I, I want to make sure I use those words correctly. And if you throw in roots for every, if you throw in enough roots for every polynomial with real coefficients, and you make sure you've got addition and multiplication still going, all that stuff, you get the complex numbers. So by, again, we're going to do this, this reckless throwing in operation. So by throwing in enough roots for all real coefficient polynomials, and I want to emphasize that you can get all the complex numbers by looking at real coefficient polynomials and getting the roots. We get the complex numbers C. That's what we call those in the same blackboard bold font. Okay, so so anyway, this has been a really quick tour. I just want to wrap it up with a picture. Yeah. Is there a better proof of that last statement in the contract about how all the real code is planning and giving you all the complicated? Okay. Give me a complex number. I mean, but like, I'm just thinking, if your complex number is a non terminating decimal, for yep. part like square root of 2. Sure. Okay, so, so how about square root of 2 plus, let's use j, j pi. Okay? How about, let's do this. Well, that's working from the complex image back up to the polynomial. Well, what I'm doing is I'm showing you that there's a real coefficient polynomial that has that as its root. So if you multiply that out, you'll get real coefficients. Okay? So, okay, that's, that's a quick, quick and dirty, but, you know. All right, let's, let's wrap it up with a picture. Just finish up that containment thingy. Give you a few words. That you don't have to remember, but are useful. These are good, like, um, you know, if someone came up to you in Hope Plaza. <laughs> you knew that was coming sooner or later, right? And, and you know, he or she had found this on the ground. Okay. And there was like a piece of paper stapled to the page that had this on it that had explanations for all the containments, but it was all washed out by the rain, the inevitable Ithaca rain. And so the person wants to know, what were the explanations here? And it gave names for all these things. Well, the explanation of the containments were to get from here to here, you throw in additive inverses. From here to here, you throw in multiplicative inverses and close it up under multiplication and addition. From here to here, you throw in limits for all the Cauchy sequences. And from here to here, you throw in roots for all the polynomials. That's what we've discussed so far. And what kinds of mathematical structures do you get? Last time I told you this is a semi-ring. This is a ring. So let me just put this down. Semi ring, and this is a ring, and this is a field, and this is a field and a complete metric space, because it has limits for all the Cauchy sequences, and this is what's called an algebraically closed field. And complete metric space. And you don't have to know these words, but if that person came up to you in Whole Plaza and said, what was on that other piece of paper, you would tell him or her, well, it probably said that N was a semi-ring and Z was a ring, you know, right? You would get that. Algebraically closed field is one where you, there's a Y missing, have roots for all your polynomials with coefficients in the field. Okay.
So any questions about this preliminary stuff before we move on to important collection of topics? William? Um, same. Yeah, yeah, same, same. Uh, how, do, how do you show that? Uh, there's, there's, I, th I think the one way I've seen doing it is you take, you take a, a decimal expansion using, or a binary expansion for the real part and the imaginary part, and you interleave them, and you get one real number. That's, that's one way to show that. You can't do a clever threading argument easily as, as we did with the natural numbers because it's sort of hard to thread continuous things. I, I, but there, there is something called a, there, there's a space filling curve argument that does that, but I, I don't know how to do that. So anyway, yep. It came from every polynomial has a root. Like if you, if you write down a polynomial with real coefficients, you want that to have as many roots, counting multiplicities at least, as the degree of the polynomial. And if it doesn't, then you're in trouble. So if every polynomial with coefficients in a given field has roots in that field, enough roots, we call it algebraically closed. There's, there's no way to extend that field by adding stuff to make every polynomial have a root. That's all. Anything else? Okay, and by the way, what was your name? You answered a question earlier. And say it one more time. Okay. All right, any other questions about this, this just weird abstract stuff? All right, well, let's, let's take a three minute break. This is what we usually do in our long classes and then come back and start talking about primes and cryptography and all that. Later on. So the next kind of round of topics I would put under the heading working with integers And in this, in this round of topics are going to be things like prime factorization, modular arithmetic, some basic theorems from that, and applications to cryptography, because that's probably the most important area that has been applied to, at least in engineering. Okay, so first of all, let's focus on the, the non-negative the, the non integers, namely the natural numbers. So think about n for a moment. So a natural number, if you have two natural numbers, a and b, so a and b are in n, we say that b is a divisor of a, Or another way of saying it, and I'll be using these interchangeably, B divides A. Or notation-wise, B with an up and down line A, that's the notation for divides, when B is a divisor of A. What does that mean? That means when there's some other natural number, maybe not even another one that natural number, a natural number C, such that A equals B times C. That's what it means for B to be a divisor of A. Okay? You've all heard that before. What are the divisors of zero? Say it louder, Ricardo. No, zero is. Dude, zero times... No, we're not dividing. We have, I did not put any quotients here. I just put a product. Clean, clean. No quotients. Everything is a divisor of zero. So note, every B in the natural numbers satisfies B divides zero. That goes under people's radar much more frequently than this one, every A in the natural numbers, satisfies, what do you think I'm going to put down now? One divides A, yes. 
So one is a divisor of everybody, and everybody is a divisor of zero. Including, by the way, zero works here as well. One divides zero, because one times zero equals zero. So now that we know what divide means, what it means for something to be a divisor of something, a natural number a bigger than 1 okay, is prime when what's true? A and 1 are A's only divisors. You've all heard that one before. Okay. So what are the prime numbers? There's one of those mathematician, physicist, engineer jokes. You know, some of them make the mathematician look good, some of them make the physicist look good, whatever. And the mathematician you're asked to prove, you're asked to answer the question, is every odd number prime? The mathematician says, let's see, uh, bigger than two. Three's a prime, five's a prime, seven's a prime, nine's not a prime, so no. The answer is no. Okay, that's the mathematician. The physicist says, three's a prime, five's a prime, seven's a prime, so up to experimental error, all odd numbers are prime. <laughs> the engineer says, three's a prime, five's a prime, seven's a prime, nine's a prime, eleven's a prime, thirteen's a prime, fifteen's a prime. Okay. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Now, prime numbers and, and all this stuff, Euclid, very long ago, he, he thought about these things a lot. Okay? He proved some really important results about prime numbers, and we're going to go over a few of those. And one of the reasons I want to go over them in some sort of carefully is because they are good ways of illustrating proof by induction. Okay? So, natural numbers, this stuff, this sort of setting is a great way to learn about proving things by induction. And how does that go? Suppose you have some statement about natural numbers. And you want to show that that statement is true for all natural numbers, or at least for all natural numbers above a certain size. So, suppose you want to prove that some statement, and let's give it a fancy name, some statement, uh, let's say, what would, a good, what would a good letter for a statement be? Don't want to use S because some statement, uh, capital V, factoid, that's what it stands for. Some statement phi of n, so that could be like n is bigger than 50, or it could be like n is prime, or whatever, is true for all n say, bigger than or equal to some n0, where n0 is given. How do you prove that by induction? This is how you prove it. Now, Jay, in, in CS2800, do they talk about induction proofs and give you a big meal about that? Yeah, okay. First off, you show that phi of n0 is true. In other words, you show that it holds for n0. And then you show that the following statement is true. You show that if 
phi of m is true for all m satisfying bigger than or equal to n0, less than or equal to n, then phi of n plus 1 is true. So you show that knowing that it's true from the bottom up to where some point, all those numbers in there, you can deduce that it's true for the next one. And the reason this shows, 1 and 2 it turns out implies, did I, is there something wrong here? Um, no, I'm saying that phi is true for all in No. See what I, what I'm what I'm saying. Okay, let's let, wait a sec. Who, who's asking? So I can look at you. Okay, wait a sec. Okay, patience. One and two implies phi of n is true for all n bigger than or equal to n zero. Why? Okay, so let me let me explain why. You show phi of n0 is true. Check. Now, let's assume that phi of n0 is true. That means phi of m is true for all m equal to n0. Yeah, therefore it's true for n0 plus 1. Now I know it's true for n0 and n0 plus 1. And I want to show that it's true for n0 plus 2, given that I know it's true for these two. Okay. And once I've shown that, I've shown that it's true for n0 plus 2, and sort of the dominoes fall. So think of, quote unquote, falling dominoes. And in fact, one of my professors in grad school, does dominoes plural have an E between the O and the S? Uh, about the pizza. <laughs> no, 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 that's apostrophe. Y yeah, but this is you can al you can always turn a, a simple into a strong. Your 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 simple one you're meaning if it's true for n then it's true for n plus one yeah. Well, th th this one is easier for us to use in the situations we're looking at. So that's all. Okay, think about falling dominoes. The way the way the professor I was about to tell you about a Raoul Bot in that I, whom I had in grad school for two courses, just an amazing teacher. He used to say, you know how to do an induct. He was Hungarian. You know how to do an induction proof. You prove for n equals zero. Then you prove for n equals 1, you prove for n equals 2, then you prove for n equals 3, and then you see how it goes. Okay, so that's okay. If that's the way you want to do it on the homework, fine. You know, but this is technically how it works. And now let's see how we apply that to Euclid, how Euclid applied it. And you'll see how, watch the dominoes fall in this proof, and, and then try to map it back to this rather abstract presentation. So, Euclid used induction. to show two very important things. Okay? First thing is, every natural number n bigger than or equal to 2 has at least one prime divisor. How did he do that? How do we fit it into this framework I've set up here? In this case, if you want to map that presentation up there, n0 is 2, because we're, we're showing something true for every n bigger than or equal to 2. And phi of n is the statement, quote, n has at least one prime divisor. Okay, so, so if you want to 
if you want to plug it into that framework, this is what we're talking about. How does this go? Number one, V of n0 is true. Why? Why is V of n0 true? n0 is 2. Does 2 have a prime divisor? What is it? 2, yes, because 2 is prime and 2 divides 2. OK, so that's the base case for the induction. Now, suppose we have shown So suppose we know that every m between, so every m satisfying 2 less than or equal to m less than or equal to n has a prime divisor. What we want to do is we want to show that this implies that n plus 1 has a prime divisor. Two cases. Case one. What if n plus 1 is prime? Does it have a prime divisor? So let's not use 1 and 2, let's use alpha. So case alpha, n plus 1 is prime, implies that n plus 1 has a prime divisor. Case 2, or case beta, n plus 1 is not prime. What, what, what is true about n plus 1 if it's not prime? It has more, than, more divisors than itself in 1. And in particular, you can write it as a product, right, of two things. Neither of which is 1 and neither of which is n plus 1. So that means that we can write n plus 1 equals the product of, say, a, b, where prepare for a noisy board descent. Here's 1. So A and B here, neither of them is n plus 1 and neither of them is 1. So that means that they're at least as big as 2 and they're as most as big as n. Now, what do we know about every number in between 2 and n inclusive? It has a prime divisor. So by assumption, by the quote unquote induction assumption, above, we know that in, say, A has a prime divisor. say p, and since p divides a, and a divides n plus 1, p divides n plus 1. So n plus 1 has a prime divisor. End of story. We've shown that assuming everything in between 2 and n inclusive has a prime divisor implies that n plus 1 has a prime divisor. 
And now we know that everything between 2 and n plus 1 has a prime divisor, and we can redo and prove that everything between 2 and n plus 2 inclusive has a prime divisor. And then we do it again, and we show that everything between 2 and n plus 3 has a prime divisor. And eventually, you'll cover all the natural numbers. Well, you, you won't, but you'll get far. OK, everybody get this? Yeah. Brian. How do we know what? Oh, every every it, yeah. You if you if you talk about if you do the you know definition of a to b divides a, you can prove easily that b is less than a, and you do that by what's called Euclid's algorithm. You say that any a can be expressed as um, m b plus r, where r is less than a, and this is a non-negative integer, okay? And that means that this is b plus b plus b plus, b plus r, and that shows immediately that b is less than a. I don't know if that satisfies you, but yeah. We're, we're not doing everything here. We're, we're doing enough, you know, trying to, you know, try, I'm trying to bury, not bury, but not do obvious things if I can avoid it, but okay. Does everybody get that? Dominoes fall. The dominoes fall one by one. All right, so Euclid used induction to show that, and then he used that to show the following. So also, courtesy of Euclid, we have this other result. And that is that there are infinitely many primes. And this is another induction. This one's actually a little easier than the other one. And this is a famous one-line proof that some of you have probably seen at parties Maybe. I don't know if you talk about stuff like this at parties. Do the, maybe the ones at Sheldon Court. No, I don't know. Like, aren't some dorms more engineering centric than others? No? Cascadilla? Yeah. So they don't strive for intellectual diversity and blah, 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 or they do. All right. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. How does this go? How does this go? Suppose that you have, say, P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 up to Pn, okay, are all the primes. Okay? Fair enough? What we want to do, we want to show that leads to a contradiction. Now, does anyone know the tricky one-line proof here? Ricardo? Okay, sounds good, sounds like a good start. Let's let A equal P1, P2, up through Pn, plus 1. Okay? Now, what do we know about A from the first Euclid thing? Let's get some other folks involved. Help me out here. The first Euclid thing says every natural number bigger than or equal to 2 has at least one prime divisor. Now, is that A bigger than or equal to 2? I should say so, right? So it has at least one prime divisor, right? J? Yeah, so I hear you. Yeah, I, you get it. OK. Because, all right. Since A is bigger than or equal to 2, 
A has at least one prime divisor. And if those are all the primes, it's got to be one of those P's, right? So it's got to be P1 or P2 or dot, 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 up to Pn. But clearly that's not the case because if I divide P1 or P2 or P3 or Pn or whatever into A, it divides the first factor and it doesn't divide the second factor, right? So that's not true. So, but obviously, none of these is a divisor of A. And that's what you were saying. And, and all your hand motions and stuff are summarized in the word obviously, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, well, the, you know, anyway. Get it? So the, the, I think that's a pretty cool argument. That's, Ricardo? This is pretty small, but is one considered a prime number? No, one is not considered a prime number. Unfortunately. Or fortunately, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, there's a couple more things I want to mention, and and one of them we'll actually prove next time, real quick at the beginning of class. But but here's a useful here's a useful thing. So here's a useful fact. If A and B are natural numbers and P is prime and P is a divisor of the product AB, then either P is a divisor of A or P is a divisor of B, or both. And I claim that's useful. You may not see it right away, but, but it turns out this pops up more often than you may think. And the intuition behind this is if P divides a product and it doesn't divide either of the product guys, what are they called? Multiplicands? <laughs> I forget. Then you, you could sort of split P in half into part that divided into A and part that divided into B. But you can't because P is prime. It's like unsplittable. It's like an elementary particle, right? A quark or something. All right, so we're not going to prove that one. And the other one that we are going to prove next time is, is a huge fact. And I guess I, I don't even have time to write it down today, but it goes like this. First, we define what it means for two things to be co-prime. They have no common factors. And then we build on that. So let's leave that for next time.